Yeah. So I won't waste your time, my guy. Make this a very good interview and a few laughs along the way. Sounds good, bro. You already know. All right. So welcome back from the desk below. Now, if you've been tuned into this platform, man, we're, we're uh, very impactful in the underground scene right now. Much like this gentleman you see right here in front of me, man. I like to say this all the time. Before there was Griselda, before there was Rock Marcy, before Duck. Well, I don't want to say before Duck now, man. But there was a time in New York City, man, where four gentlemen got together. And, man, they made some music, man. And the impact that these gentlemen have, man, man, I'm surprised that, you know, a lot of the underground artists, man, are actually collaborating with them, man, because they should. Because you know why? The gentlemen deserve their flowers for the work they put in throughout the years. They're actually celebrating their 20th anniversary for their debut and only the album. Um, I'd like to welcome my guy, formerly known as Gore-Tex, or you may know him as Gore Elohim. Man, I got my guy, Lord Goat, in the building. Peace, peace, peace. Yeah, all those names are applicable. Um, Lord Goat, Gore Elohim, Gore-Tex, or Reverend Gore-Tex, I mean... I've had so many names in the past. It doesn't, it doesn't even matter. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Well, that uh, because I know when um I've been a fan of you for a long time, man, and I I've been watching your I actually owned a green mixtape DVD, so I've been well in tune with you guys for well over before I got into media. So I already know what the gist of it right now. So I think that you know I would ask you some fan questions. You know that you probably never been asked for. So I was curious, uh, Lord Goat. When you were making the name Lord Goat, we obviously know somebody ratted on you with the Gore-Tex name. But I was curious, right. how come you didn't stick with Gore Elohim? And is Lord Goat an actual metal band that's defunct at the moment? Um, You know, I came up with the name Gore Elohim, and I'll be honest with you, for a while I liked it. And for some reason, it just, it just I just wanted to change. There was no real legal reasons, even though Technically, if I was going to use the name Gore, I couldn't really use it for more than one record. Mm, makes sense. That that was that was a legal thing. So it's like when I when I had the situation with Gore-Tex years ago, they said that if I wanted to promote myself for one record or if I was doing a tour, let's say, I can use the name very minimally, but I can't really use it after that. So I figured I would use Gore Elohim so people could at least know where the hub is of, of what I'm doing now. Because, you know, obviously in the last few years, the whole name change, it's got a lot of people confused. So some people don't even know I had to change my name twice. As far as it being a band name, I think so. But I was more influenced by a band called Goat Lord. Okay. And, yeah, they actually were around. Um, they broke up now. I don't think anybody knows about them or gives a shit about them, really. But they were a <laughs> Vegas band. They are from Las Vegas. And... um. They just just crazy dudes, you know what I mean? And like their lyrics were like really ultra offensive, and they broke up. So I was like, I could use the name, or I can just switch it around. And after I kind of switched it around, I realized that there was some band using that name from, I think Australia or somewhere. But yeah, that that shit doesn't really that shit doesn't bother me because nobody nobody knows who they are, nobody cares, and um. Yeah, I just didn't really care. I like the way it sounded. Um, you know, I'm still, I'll be honest with you, I'm still not in love with it. Like, it's not my favorite name. My my name I would choose right now would be my real fucking name, which is Gore-Tex. Yeah. So as an artist, it's extremely frustrating when you can't use your own name and hundreds and thousands of people know you as a certain name, but you can't use the name, you know? So it's it's very frustrating to have to, like, start from scratch and try to come up with something you feel comfortable with as well as something you like. And that's never going to happen again. I mean, I told this story a hundred times. Everybody knows how I actually got my name, you know? Yeah. You know, it was more special that Q-Tip from Tribe actually gave me the blessing to use the name. So the fact that I can't use the name and had to start over, it's like it's it was very anticlimactic for me as far as a name. Some people could just pick a name and... You know, like Bill is just ill Bill. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? He's, that's him. Like, right. I can't just do that. I can't be like murder Mitch. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I can. <laughs> but... Yeah. So it's it's been really frustrating, bro. You have to start. And then with social media, branding yourself, 
you know, branding yourself generally takes about a year or two. Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's like that didn't really that didn't really work either because uh, people just confused. You know, it doesn't matter how much press I do. Um, it, it's just like there's like gatekeepers, or I don't know what the fuck you want to call it, but it's like people make it very convenient not to be able to find my music or not be able to find my vinyl, or you know, people want to claim, oh, what's his name now? We don't know what it, it's. You know, it's 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 annoying. It's been a hindrance. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to lie and say, oh, yeah, I love the whole concept. I know for a fact some people don't like the name, but I don't give a fuck. There's nothing I can do about it. See, I'm going to have to, you know, it, it, it's like I was going to have to pick something Yeah. after a while. So it's like, what are you going to pick? You know, it's like you don't have something that, because everyone's going to know me as Gore. Oh, yeah, of course. So what do I use? You know, I can't use anything but Gore for more than one record. So that's why I did Electric Lucifer, Gore, Elohim. I can't be Gore Sabbath or Gore Manson, anything. I can't really use that again. So that's why people go, like, oh, why'd you change the name again? Because I could only do one record using the Gore name. So, you know, it's like a whole other headache. I was like, you know what? I was like, I don't give a fuck. Like, my name could be anything. My name could be, you know, it doesn't really matter. If people are going to find out about the music, and if they're interested in the music, they'll find out about it. If they're not, then they're just going to have excuses and say, oh, I didn't know he changed his name. And, you know, I didn't know, but you knew years ago. Yeah, exactly. So you're, either, you're either you fuck with me or you don't fuck with me. That's that's really where it's at with a lot of people. And a lot of these dudes are just, a lot of these dudes are fake and phony in the industry. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's kind of like people who fuck with me, fuck with me. You know where to find me. You know what I'm about. You know, it's like, Anybody who follows me knows I put out quality shit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, Maybe God. it's not it's not as much, it's not as quick as other artists. You know what I'm saying? Because every artist is putting out a record, albums, two albums a year, a new single every month. So in a sense, you can say I'm not as consistent as other rappers who work faster that just put out tons of music. But my track record is always there. Oh, as yeah. never having put out anything I feel that's been whack. You, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like a scale. It's a give or take. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I had to do this and A, B, and C and all these trials and tribulations, but I never was forced to put out anything whack or anything I can't stand behind. You know what I mean? So to me, that was the pros and cons and the, and the I guess, the negative and positives about changing the name. You know what I mean? Well, what I like about like the name change new to now too is like, with this whole new, like, if you if you probably know what it's now, too, like, you know, the boom bap renaissance, the drumless beats is actually making a comeback. But that was there years ago now, too. And we're having, like, right. a generation of kids. Like, I'm 34. I ain't no kid no more. But we have, like, a whole new generation right. who listen to, you know, like a Griselda or Rock Marciano or Ito. But then they, they discover, like, you know, I heard a load goat on uh ito's album let me check out like you know load goat and Stu Bainer's album and it puts them on to somebody who never may have heard of you before and they're like you know i actually no heard Lord goat. then they actually find out do the track back and they're like oh and then they go back and do the history so i think the name change is actually a good thing too and i like uh, blessing in disguise right right yeah i mean you know it depends how you look at it i really didn't have a choice so I kind of made I made uh I made the best out of it. I agree with what you said. I mean, for people that don't know, they'll see me on so and so's album or um, you know, do a beat for this guy. So that does help. But also it's interesting when people don't know my past. Of I'll course. get messages from people that are like, yo, I'm really digging the shit. I like that beat or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But they don't know I did something like years ago for somebody. They don't know I rapped on somebody's beat. So it's it's interesting to see people find out about older stuff because I don't really even like to promote the older stuff because I'm not like I'm not one of these artists that live in the past. Like I don't like I'm saying I get people why they like my old records. That's cool. You know what I'm saying? But I don't live off of them in a sense like it doesn't make me dope because I put out some dope record fifteen years ago. Yeah. That shit doesn't that shit don't matter to a lot of people. It matters, yo, what is this guy doing now? Is, is he official now? Is he is like, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, you can't really, you know, it's like, you can't really brush aside the truth. You know what I'm saying? You could say, some kids could say, oh, I don't like those guys or 
you know, you get kids that are like 20 years old. They just yeah. heard their first Benny record. You know what I mean? They just sold a nickel bag of pot. They're like, ah, I don't fuck with them dudes. They don't know any better. You know what I'm saying? They don't know the history. Is not, in a sense, it's like our shit to me, and it's just my opinion, our shit still sounds new to where you can't really, you know, and I'm not saying it because I think I'm great or I'm amazing, but it's like, for instance, the other day, I was listening to somewhere, I think it was Spotify, I don't know, some some streaming thing, and um, and a song came on with somebody I did. It's like maybe three, four years ago, but even maybe five years ago, but I didn't even like, it sounded brand new, you know what I'm saying? To, at least to my ears. So yeah. even going back further, going back further, if you put on older stuff, it's like I feel like I get hated on because some people still don't understand it, you know what I'm saying? They'll put on something from 15 years ago, and they be like, yo, bro, I don't even understand what the fuck you're talking about in your verse. Like, I don't get it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll explain it to them, and it's still 15 years later, and it's like, don't be mad at me because you, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Like, I'm not going to slow down my shit and dumb me down for people that don't know what I'm talking about. Like, I've had to do that for years. Like, I got I to gotta be like, all right, man. I see like I'm dealing with people that ain't that sharp. Kids ain't as sharp as I think they are. So now I got to dumb it down for people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> people ain't getting it. So, you know, at the end of the day, I do it for me. So it's sort of like I'm having fun. If people want to check it out, that's great. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not going to compromise my style to make it more tangible, more something so people could digest it better. What what I also noticed now too is like you guys broke down a lot of doors now. Like what I noticed now too, like I like how you're wearing the Slayer shirt right now too, because I remember it was in like the maybe mid two thousand when Dipset was popping, when all these rappers they started wearing like you know rocker tees like Metallica. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was curious about like you know like when you started seeing like you know the mainstream starts going that way, but you guys been doing that like. What goes through your head? No one's like, man, I was I was early on that. Like, 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 what goes through your head when you see something like that? I mean, it's weird because it's like I've seen it and I've seen like I've seen the very beginning of it, I've seen yeah. the middle of it, and then you see the horror show where you see like Kim Kardashian coming oh. out of a place wearing like an Exodus shirt or Iron Maiden, you know, and like, you know, this guy from Blink 182. Travis, like he's married to these Kardashians, you know, and like she's wearing like a napalm death shirt. So it's just kind of weird because the thing is, like, this was always my thing because this is what, like, I felt comfortable with wearing whatever I wanted to wear. Yeah. See, people would like, rappers would be scared to wear what they want to wear. They felt like, you know, one day they can't wear this or they can't wear that. Like, that's not really the way I grew up. Like, I grew up where I grew up. I kind of just wore what I wanted to wear, whatever made me comfortable. So in the 80s, like in the in the mid or late 80s, or let's just say in the early 80s, like I'm a young kid, I wear a pair of brand new Pumas, but I rock an Iron Maiden shirt and a pair of brand new Lees. Or like, like I incorporated that shit because it made it comfortable for me and nobody else was doing that because That's they were ashamed. Fun. Right, right. They were ashamed. They were embarrassed. They thought that um, they couldn't be themselves because a lot of people not of color or just to say non-white rappers like a lot of these guys are really concerned about they're so worried about what other people think of them based on their credibility but it's like i was there from the beginning you know what i'm saying so i never felt any certain way like i got a front for people or i got to show off that uh, you know whatever it is you know what i'm saying it's like i've been there from the beginning so i've always felt comfortable doing that it's weird to see people doing it but it's like more commercial rappers. Yeah. It's like rappers that don't know who the fuck Morbid Angel is or whoever these guys are, and they'll just rock the shirts, which to me is funny. It doesn't bother me. It bothers me when the people that talk shit about it, then they want to go and do it. Yeah. You know? Or they'll wear, they'll wear a shirt they don't even know about the band. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you don't, like, you don't have to be a diehard fan. But it's kind of like you don't need to be wearing it either, unless you know what you know what you're supporting. Yeah, you know? kind of know at least something. Like you know, when I see people like seeing Wu Tang, I always want to ask him to name all nine members. Uh, hip hop's always taken forms of influence from other cultures. Okay. You know, back in the day, hip hop was just as much a part of rock 
as it was funk, you know, as it was soul. You know, Africa Bombada was a huge Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath fan. I mean, even though I know Africa Bambada, people think he's a weirdo and he fucked up and, you know, it's whatever. I'm just talking about the roots and legends oh, yeah. of hip hop. And like Bambada and those guys, they respected other forms of music. That's why like back in the day, Bambada, he or whoever, Cool Herc, whoever these guys, they'd be cutting up like, you know, Aerosmith, um, The Power of Zeus, like all these obscure rock you know, stuff that came from a rock background, you know. Also keep in mind, it's like, you know, Run DMC used heavy metal guitars on their first three records. Very true. I was going to say that. So, and, you know, and to be honest with you, you know, those riffs, those riffs to Rockbox and the other joint, those riffs are still hard. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Like, if you put that shit on, that riff is hard as fuck, bro. And it's like, who thought of doing that? Nobody thought of doing that except them. Because they were surrounded by people that were also, you know, Rick Rubin, Def Jam, all those guys. They were around rock too. But Run DMC were the first to really incorporate that. And PE and Public Enemy, because obviously Public Enemy, back in the day, they sampled Slayer. Oh, yeah. For one of the songs. Um, so, you know, I thought that was, for me, that was like, I couldn't believe that shit. I was like, yo, Public Enemy is sampling Slayer? That's crazy, bro. <laughs> You know, it didn't make sense to me, but at the same time, it made all the sense in the world because all that sounding stuff, like Public Enemy, to me, it was very closely related to to metal and thrash and just the aggression of hardcore punk. It was coming from a different area. You know what I mean? Public Enemy are coming from the ghettos of Long Island, whereas a lot of these hardcore kids, they're also coming from shitty areas in Brooklyn or Long Island. So there was a common struggle so those scenes are very closely related without paying a lot of lip service about it, you know? Because some guys in hip-hop don't want to admit it, that they like metal. or Because the thing is, it's not really cool in hip-hop to admit you like anything except Wu-Tang and Griselda and Mob Deep. People don't want to talk about, like, that's real music. But I'm talking about real, real music. You know what I mean? Like, people didn't want to, like, really... Um, people didn't even really want to talk about it. It was, like, almost like a weakness, you know? Yeah, it's like but then you find out. But then you find out, like these, you know, a lot of these guys are listening to that, and like you know, like just stuff that's not even hip hop. You know what I mean? Like back in the day, I'm in L.A. I was like walking up Santa Monica, and like Redman and and Meth are in like a Chevy Suburban, blasting Red Hot Chili Peppers, Californication, at like the highest decibels possible. <laughs> so I was like, "Yo, Red Meth are listening to Chili Peppers." Which which isn't like them listening to Slayer or DRI or they pump that, oh, yeah. but it's still it's still cool that they're open minded enough to at least pump that in the in the truck, you know. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool. So like even like with music now too, because like what I like to say about this underground renaissance is now too, like there's a lot of vinyl deals going on too. Like people say things like to go around in circles now too, and like vinyl is through the roof now too. So I was curious now too, knowing that you're not big on your past releases and stuff like that now too. But have you ever thought about like you know like like a celebration for like your art of dying, but just like putting your name on it as low as go, like for some vinyl? Because like I don't think that I don't think it probably was pressed up on vinyl back in the day. But if you think about it today, your know, vinyl just going through the roof nowadays. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, the thing is. It the Art of Dying is a project that's not, it's not just my project. You know, there's, there's, there's other, there's another person involved. So, uh, with that said, it's like, I don't think, I don't think that would happen. I think it would be a cool idea, but I wouldn't really count on it. You know, yeah. plus the company, the company itself, I would have to stick a different name on that. And for me to stick a different name on that, I still got to deal with the same people. Yeah. So yeah. it's not really, you know, it's not really, um, unfortunately, it's not really that feasible for me to really do that, which sucks because a lot of people would want to hear, um, I mean, I know, number one, the album needs a remix because, you know, I, I was never happy with the mix and the mastering on that record in particular compared to all the records, the other records that came out. It didn't sound right to me, but that was just my opinion. You know what I mean? But one of your singles now too, like I I love this, and I was like, 
I remember the first time I heard it on the Green DVD, the single of Hatred. Man, like, I was always curious, like, how come that never made, like, the actual album for the future is now? Because I remember when you guys did the show at SOBs, you performed it there, and just the energy off that record, like, you know when you hear, see someone perform it live, and you go back and listen to it, and it hits you different? Like, how is yeah, it, of course. like, how come, like, that track, like, in particular, was never included on that album? Oh, uh, because Hated, Hated from the Gecko, and the B-side is New America. To that, to that, to that record, that was originally to be dropped as a twelve-inch. Hate in the New America were going to be released on uh, on my boy's label at the time, which was called Imperial Records, and we did the record, which is exactly uh, exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to put a record out with two new songs that I did that weren't released. So I did those as a solo artist, like those, you know, uh, the guys from nonfiction. They were never on that beat, so it was never really a thing I brought to the table. It wasn't like I said, okay, Futures Now is almost done. Let me put Hated on it. You know? It was just going to be a, it was just going to be a 12-inch. It was just going to be a record. You know what I mean? So we weren't really going to, uh, we weren't going to put it on there. People ask me what happened to the record and, you know, it's not really, there's not much I can say. It's a hard-to-find record and it's extremely <laughs> rare yeah. because not the guy who actually Put it out through his label because I mean these are, these are both guys I know for years, but um, the guy who put out the actual vinyl itself, the guy who had the pieces of the records, I don't know exactly what happened. If he went bankrupt or he had some issues, and um, I don't know exactly what happened. All I know is I didn't I didn't really get a lot of copies of that record either, and I know there were a lot of records, well at least a lot of copies floating around at one point that I tried to get my hands on. But, um, you know, shit happens. So I don't know if this guy is sitting on him or if he got rid of them. But, yeah, that song was just a single. Um, my friend Jigsaw produced that. And uh, there's a B-side, New America, which I did. So I did the B-side. Um, we were going to do a video for that. Never transpired. But we used to do it. I mean, when nonfiction performed. Oh, yeah. Each of us, yes, sir. Yeah, each of us would do a song. So sometimes, you know, I might do Hated or, you know, I might do Celebrity Roast or I might do one of these other joints, you know? Yeah, like, shout out to my guy, Serge, if you want to. Yo, Serge, you show a lot of love, guy. What's up, my guy? Or shout out to Serge right there. So I was, no um, I was curious now with Serge now, too. During the early days of nonfiction, yes, we all know Serge was a member, but do any particular records exist or Serge on the on these records that were just never released that you can remember? Because I know it was a while back. Um yeah there's definitely a few records that we did uh we did more as demos yeah at the beginning which we really released. Label, right? Correct. So I mean it's not like a plethora of stuff, but there's probably maybe three or four songs that search was on that people didn't really hear. I mean obviously the first single we did he was on that um, legacy. Oh yeah, and, but, uh, like like the ones we actually never got to hear. Because you know how when you yeah, the demo, we never get to hear those demos. Correct, correct. Well, I mean, again, there wasn't that. It wasn't like he was on the whole album. Yeah, it wasn't know, like yeah. he was going to be on the future. Is now, you know, like we did a couple of things, and uh, to be honest with you, we would have did more, but the vibe wasn't really there. Like he wasn't really he wasn't really interested in writing lyrics. I mean, he was trying to handle some other business and stuff, which was cool. Yeah. But as far as on the lyrical tip, he wasn't really holding his own, you know. So the thing is, like, we would just try to help him out. You know what I'm saying? And But, you know, he was kind of doing a million different things. So he would have been on more songs that we released if he was around. You know, I, mean, I, got, I got kids too, but this guy's got kids. and He's running out of the studio. He's got to... He's doing a million things, so it's like it's not like he could have sat down and sat and wrote ten verses. Yeah, exactly. Just right, like he didn't have the time. And it's always like I always like I don't know if you watch Marvel, but it's like I like to you know like some of the hip hop's what if one of the what ifs is like yeah what if the search was on like the future is now like what would that album like have an impact now too? But I also like how it adds on to his legacy now too because the four of you gents went through hell making that album. I heard like like. 
Yeah, it was a nightmare. Everything, you know, I mean, it was a nightmare because we had to overcome so many, so many obstacles that a lot of these kids, you know what I'm saying, these dudes don't get it because it's like these, these kids, these new kids fall out of bed and they got 50,000 followers on Instagram. You know, they're doing, uh, they're doing work with companies. They get, you know, it's all this other stuff that wasn't in the hip hop industry when we started getting big. Like we have our legacy, whatever you want to call it. We have our legacy now because of people that really felt it in their heart, not yeah. because of social media. Because the fact is, social media really hasn't done much for nonfiction. Oh. It's really not. It's really not. It's 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 we. It's like we missed the boat because we were so early doing that. Like we were repping so hard that it was almost it worked against us because we didn't have the internet. We did all that shit pre-internet, bro. Uh, we I, hustled, we hustled, we made connects, we called record labels. I mean, I'm doing this shit since I'm like 11 years old. I've been doing music. I've been listening to music as a listener since I'm four years old. So I'm not like whatever's going on, like whatever I'm here for, I've been destined to do this shit. I could have went to law school. I could have been a pharmacist if I, you know, went to college. If I, you know, went to college after grad, you know, I didn't, I didn't graduate. But if I didn't, I, there's things I could have done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's a legacy, but it feels good to know that we did it without anybody helping us. I mean, really helping us. We had a, a little bit of help, but not really, because everything that somebody tried to help us with, they took three back. So if we got one, they took three back. They, they, You know, it was a constant thing. And even finding a record label, people don't even know that because nobody gets record deals anymore. The only kids that get record deals now or guys that hang out with like, you know, kids in Florida and, and drill rappers and, you know, A and R people that work at record labels aren't thirty years old anymore. These guys are twenty years old, they're thirty pounds, they have braids, and they wear latex pants. It's true. I, I, I even I, I don't like to agree with it, but it is true though. So those are the guys signing people to labels. And, and people that do real shit, underground, whatever, boom bap, whatever you want to call it, there's no chance in hell they're going to get an actual record deal. Like a real record deal. Because all that is is just the labels basically giving you a bank loan. And they don't want to bank on anybody that's over 25 years old. And that's a fact because I've spoken to A&R guys that work at labels. And if you're 20, 28 years old, if you're 31, you're not getting a deal. You're over, bro. So, you, you know, I'm friends with a lot of rappers and there's some guys I know, you know, that, you know, it's not about age, but it's like there's guys I know that are like in their 40s and they're talking about trying to start now. Like now yeah, they want to get serious. Yeah, bro, that's not the, not like, yo, bro, like, yo, bro, I was doing this when I was 16 yeah. and you were nowhere to be found. I was doing this when I was 35. You were nowhere to be found. That's now true. all these guys are 46 and they're jumping out. And they expect like they they expect something. And it's like it's too late, bro. It's not like you should have some people close to you that should tell you, don't do this. It's not for you. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. not. It's like, not for you. It's you know gonna work, bro. Like, see, that's what I like about like your story now, too, is because like what do people like you notice they get like a taste of the industry? You start to change, but you never change throughout that whole time. Like I remember there was a time when like, even like I remember when MySpace was a thing now too. And I remember when you were missing like from the warp too, and they were like putting like like rap forms on there, like Gore-Tex can't make show, Gore-Tex is drunk. But like what what I like about now too is that you never let that got you. Even like when the internet saw the boomer of MySpace, you never like nobody fed into that. That's what I like about. It. Well, 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 well. The, the problem was, it's like the way the internet was at that time. It's like the internet was a new thing. So yeah. if somebody could type out a page of sixty-five or seventy lies, it doesn't really matter because once you put it online, people read that as the truth anyway. Yeah. So in a sense, it's like it was real funny because back then. You know, I'm getting messages from people like, yo, uh, why are you not touring? Is it true you're an alcoholic? And I'm like, it's hysterical to me because everybody that knows me knows I never drink. I'm not an alcoholic. I actually, I've drank maybe eight beers to 10 beers in my fucking life. Oh, shit. <laughs> everybody knows I'm saying, everybody knows I fuck with this. 
Oh yeah, of course, the loud. I even know. So what? So, so you know, it, it's like listen, people can say whatever they want. Anybody in the know, everybody knows that all that shit was bullshit. And let me tell you something: people are still actively working just as hard to fuck my shit up today as it was yesterday. Yeah, that's so in that sense, don't think anything changed just because you don't see, uh, you know, like emails or or pictures that are, uh, you know. That people Photoshop pictures. That shit, let me tell you something. That shit, that shit only blew me up in a sense. Because people are like, you know, how could all this stuff be true? But I was being quiet. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, you know something? It's not even when the time is right, then I would say something. But until then, it's 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 all a joke. You know what I'm saying? If, if, if people aren't talking about you, hating you, and trying to ruin your career constantly, you're not doing it right. You're just not doing it. And it's also so, it's also now too, because your legacy now too is now too, a lot of people cannot say they were acknowledged by the greats because when people think of Pete Rock, DJ Premier, you worked with all of these guys and it's like with nonfiction now too, this is what I like about nonfiction now too. You guys got to tour the world with your music. You guys didn't go on trips trying to promote yourselves out there. You guys were very right. booked out there. I remember seeing you guys at stadiums and like I think it was in like Columbia. You guys did like a stadium. It's like and everybody there, like like so did you ever see yeah. that when making the future? Yeah, that was that was that was one actually it's it's interesting you bring that up. That's one of the craziest shows we did because we we turned up there and I never been to Columbia, you know, the group at the time, we never been to Columbia. So we didn't really know what to expect. So we get over there and uh you know, the promoter tells us it's basically 15,000 people. And um, it's like they do this thing once a year for, for hip hop. And they have all the groups in Colombia come, like local groups. And they usually get one or two guys from, from the States to, to headline the show. So I was just really psyched to do it because I never been there. And we get there and it's like 100 degrees out. But oh, yeah. it's like a real soccer old school stadium. Like the cement stadiums, where okay. they're not even, you know, the seats aren't even real. They're just cement seats, you know? So it's just one huge piece of cement, you know? And it's a crazy show because we're in a van, and the show, that particular show in Columbia was on top of a mountain. Oh. So we had to take, yeah, so we had to get in the van and drive 25 minutes up the mountain. So as soon as we get up the mountain, it's mad people, bro. It's like, I see 10,000 people. And I look in the crowd and I see dudes jumping around drinking 40s of beer. And I'm like, yo, this place has no security. <laughs> you, I'm like, yo, 10,000 people in Colombia with no security, somebody could get really fucked up here. You know what oh. I mean? Somebody could get real fucked up. So we get there and we, we had merch with us. We had T-shirts and all this other shit. So we go to set up our merch and the promoter comes in because this guy we brought with us from the States to sell merch with us, this guy, Pete, he put the merch out there for two seconds on the table and they already stole the merch. People already oh, robbing him left and right. He, bro, he couldn't even take the stuff out of the box. They were ripping the box apart. So yeah. he took what he could and he ran back in and he's like, yo, shit is crazy out there. They want, like, they want you guys. You know what I'm saying? So for us, it was, it was for us, that was the biggest festival we had done up until that day, you know what I'm saying? For me personally, you know, like 14, 15,000 people, that was a lot of people for myself, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, yo, it was crazy, bro. People were singing the words. Like, at least 30% of the crowd, at least at least, at least, least people in front of me, everybody was singing the choruses, and you know what I'm saying? I was like, yo, this is bugged out. Like, I didn't really know that they were really, they were really that tuned in with us, you know? So... Yeah. Yeah, for us that was you know that was one for the books, because it's also interesting. After the show, um, we were going to get in the van to leave, and and it's like we could tell we were getting set up because like all these chicks were coming after us. They were like, "Yo, come in the van. We're going to a party. We're going to a party," and it was so weird because it's like in my other ears, like this other homie, he's like, "Yo, don't get in that van." You know what I'm saying? He's like, "I wouldn't get in the van if I were you." I'm like, yo, bro, we're out of here, bro. I'm not, you know, I don't give, 
I don't give a fuck about pussy like that, bro. I'm not trying to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not like, I'm good, bro. I'm like, let's go back to the hotel, you know? But what's interesting also is we go back to the hotel and the next day, because we were going to stay there for like two extra days, I tried to get weed. And for some reason, the weed this kid gave me was the worst I've ever seen. It was like, was it he, it's like, he, yeah, very weird. It's like he went outside and he pulled out grass from the street. Yeah, and he I, literally put it in a bag. I'm like, what the fuck is this, bro? You can't smoke it. You'll, can't you'll smoke die. It, bro. Even though it's called grass, you can't smoke it. Exactly, bro. This guy was really trying to give me actual grass, you know? <laughs> See, with, with that being said now, too, did you ever think that you would be able to travel the world with your music Well, first starting out, 96 till 2002? Because you've been, a, like, you guys have been booked since I think you guys first went overseas in 96. But did you think it would be a continuous stint throughout your career? Um, I mean, one part of me, I would only say yes because at one part of me, we were get, we were signed, we were about to get signed to a major label, which is a whole other topic that we had so many opportunities and bad luck that we we were almost signed to two major labels. So when you're in when you're in communication with a label that you're going to get signed, you know, you're automatically thinking that even if you don't you don't blow up and have a plat- a platinum record that year with the record deal you're going to make eight albums yeah solid because yeah. that's because that's part of the contract we were signed to Geffen Records which was a major label at the time which was Guns N' Roses record label and and the contract we had was for eight albums so you know every year you're getting a higher advance so if all you have to do is make sure you don't get dropped so if you don't get dropped from a label, they have to give you money every time you put a record out, yeah. which also exponentially gets higher. So if we had a label and we stayed with Geffen by the fourth album, you know, we would be getting eight hundred thousand dollars up front, nine hundred thousand, you know. So we would be in a certain league where we're just on some other shit. Like we would just gradually gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So in one sense, to answer your question, yeah, I did think if we were actually going to get a record deal and sign it and be part of a major label roster, then we would be around in 20 years. In my mind, I was like, if this shit falls through, everybody's fucked. You're going to be selling drugs. You're going to be cutting roast beef in the deli. You know, yeah. and that, that's nothing wrong with that, but that's what, that's what we were, that's what we were dealing with. So the fact that we had to deal with all this stress from labels, you know, became a whole other thing, you know. So we would it's like we were the group, like the almost what would have happened group, because we were in so many bigger situations where other people, let's say they had good luck and you know, instead of us having shitty fucking luck, you know, they would have gotten signed, you know. So to search his credit because you mentioned Search before, to Search's credit, he tried to get us a deal by bringing us up to Russell Simmons' condo in Manhattan when Russell Simmons lived, I don't know if you're familiar with Manhattan, when there was a Tower Records on Broadway. Anyways, the Tower Records on Broadway in the city back in the day, you know? It was a very popular Tower Records. And above that, like 45 stories high, Russell Simmons lived above that in a penthouse apartment. It must have been a penthouse. It, it, it was literally a penthouse. So, you know, like shit like that. We were kids, bro. We were just kids. I mean, you know, we, we rolled up. We were hanging out with Search. You know, Search like, yo, I'm going to take you guys to see Russell. I'm trying to get you guys a deal. <laughs> Honestly, me being a fan with the history I had, I couldn't believe it. Of course. I was like, are we really going to Russell's Club right now? Are we really going there? And we did. We went up there. You open, you know, you get off the floor, the elevator opens right in his apartment. Yeah. So, you know, it it, there was so many steps that we did. I, I can't think of honestly, I can't think of any group that really paid as many dues as we did. You know, and I'm not saying it like we're cool or um, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter. But I'm saying I don't know anybody that paid dues like we did, yeah. and I don't know anybody at the same time. I was probably let down 
as much as we were from the industry, considering how far we would get, and then we would get knocked off and have to start here again. Yeah, no. Yeah. Then we would then we would get interest from another label, not get signed, and we'd have to, you know. So we were climbing so gradual where other groups, once they got that plug, or if they met somebody or whoever, they'd get a deal, and then three months later, you would see them with a video, and then they'd blow up, and that's the end of it. And then, you know, with us, everything was difficult, and everything was a game, and then this guy's trying to rob us, this guy fucks up the deal. So it's like we went through a lot of shit that a lot of guys doing this now wouldn't even understand because those opportunities don't even exist. Yeah, because it's like, yeah, because it changed so drastically now, too. Like, even, like, I remember, I like how you brought up the labels now, too, because I think that label would have been perfect for you when Paul Rosenberg expressed, like, interest in managing you guys. I remember when I heard that room, I was like, yeah, that would have been perfect for Shady Records, nonfiction and Shady. Didn't have to have Eminem on it, just the fact that the branding was on it, too. Right, right. Well, that, well that's, what, that's, what, that's what we said. That's what we said, because... Yeah, also, that's another thing, because Paul, when when Eminem first came out, nobody knew who Eminem was. Yeah. So Paul Paul took Eminem to Manhattan, and he was taken into all the shows. So we were doing the show. I think we were opening up for Run DMC or something. I don't know exactly what it was, but he brought, he brought M to the show. So yeah, M came to knew. our show, and nobody knew who he was. You know what I'm saying? He's wearing some dirty black leather jacket, a hat. Nobody knew. Nobody cared. I knew he was going to blow up just by the way Paul was handling him. But Paul did like our stuff. Paul was a fan. And we were kind of like, yo, man, can, can you know, we've been doing this. You know, can you help us out? He's like, yo, you guys are fresh. I love you guys. I, I just don't have the time, man. He's like, this guy, Marshall, is taking up all my time, bro. He's like, I don't even have time for my family. Like, I like that's how much he was working for, for M. So, I think Paul wanted to help us, but it was just it was too much on his plate. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So so that didn't really work out. And then like Rick Rubin from oh, you yeah. know Def Jam Warner Brothers, Rick Rubin also listen. He knew who we were, and you know we had like a mutual person try to like talk to him, be like yo, help these guys out. Like these are like these guys are the real deal. And he was just like supposedly what I heard. He was like yo, I heard about those guys. Those guys are really dope. I don't have the time right now. I'm just like, I'm, I got a million other things to do right now. I'm not really in the process of like signing a new group right. and doing that, you yeah. know? So it's like, all right, cool. It's like, what's next? You know, it's like how many people you can get to a certain level back then, but how many people are going to deny you, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't really matter the reason. So then we were going to get a deal with Warner brothers from somebody else, which was T-Ray, our other homie. So we go up to Warner Brothers, and this is like when all that Lincoln Park shit. Remember Lincoln Park came Park out, and right, all, right. That, all that shit. Styles of people. And videos. those guys were right, and those guys were gonna sign Lincoln Park. So the A and R kid at Warner, he was this Asian dude named Kevin, and Kevin was a huge fan of nonfiction. You know what I'm saying Kevin was like, "Listen, you know, nonfiction should be on Warner Brothers. Y'all are dope. I really want to get these guys interested in you." So we can just sign you up. So we were like, all right, cool. Finally, this should happen, you know? And um, we gave Kevin our tape, which had like black helicopters. It had uh, specifically CIA is trying to kill me. That was the second song on there. So, excuse me. I know. So long story short, we give Kevin the tape and we go back for another meeting at Warner Brothers, and he's like, yo, bro, I played the nonfiction tape. I played the demo for, for Lincoln Park. Yeah. <laughs> so we were like, all right, cool, because they showed us a video. I think it was One Step one step Beyond or One Step with the first oh, single. One Step Closer, yeah. One, right, so they played me One Step Closer, which I thought the song was cool. I didn't think the fashion was cool and the dyed hair. I thought okay. all that shit was whack. But I thought the music was okay. So I was like, yeah, bro, these guys are cool. And he was like, yo, these guys love you. You know, like I played them the demo. They asked me to copy it. Like, you know, I, I didn't know what to say. These guys, they loved it. And they want to do something with, with nonfiction. So we were like, all right, cool. Like, we'll fuck with them. So he was like, yeah, you know, we're going to sign them. Well, they're already signed. 
but we got to do some preliminary stuff. Yeah. So let's see how this works out. And you guys can work together and do something, you know, video or single. So we were like, all right, cool. Even though we were more on the urban, we were more from like the urban, like we were, we were a street group, basically. We weren't a put together fake tough guy thing. We were an actual street group from the streets. So it was a little different than what they were doing. Straight from but, the urban, yeah. Right. These guys are from like OC and like, you know, these guys hang out with everything. Yeah, from a like, garage in the garage. Yeah, somewhere. yeah. They're playing new metal and they're from Cali and like, it's, it's just different for us. And so that's fine. Whatever. A few months go by and this guy Kevin doesn't sign us for whatever happens or the meeting, whatever, it, whatever happened. We didn't, we didn't get signed by Warner Brothers. And the Linkin Park album comes out, the first one. Yeah, hybrid theory. And I'm listening to it and I'm listening to it you know, because like even at the time, like my son, my son was little, but my kid liked Lincoln Park when the first album came out. Like he was a little kid. He liked it. So I was like, all right, cool. You know, he wanted me to buy the record for him. So I bought him the record. So I put on this, the sixth, uh, number six, which I think is a song called Paperclip, Papercut. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I put on Papercut and I'm like, I'm listening to it. I'm like, yo, this sounds weird. I don't know why. It sounds like it's not clicking with me. And then I hear the chorus. And it's like, basically, this guy's ripped off the chorus of CIA. They ripped off, like, half the chorus. Oh, yo, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, so if you listen to paper clip, paper cut, he's like, I'm paranoid. I'm looking over my back. So they're listening to nonfiction 85 times a day. But we're like, I'm paranoid. So that whole paranoid shit, they literally stole from us the same week they recorded that. You know what I'm saying? And... I, you know, it's like, it's not the end of the world, but it's like, yo, bro, you guys know you stole the chorus, right? They know they did. So at least be cool. Like, we didn't get to deal with Warner Brothers, which is fine. Yeah. But at least they should have contacted us and said, listen, we loved your demo. We couldn't stop listening to it. We were huge fans of nonfiction. Yeah, we stole your chorus. Big fucking deal. You know, we'll give you royalty points. So if you gave us royalty points, that record sold like 16 million copies. What also, I want to add on to that now too, which also is kind of weird now too, because they remixed that album called Reanimation and the whole first album was remixed. So at least they could have added you on the paper cut remix because I remember that whole album right. Was remixed. Right, right. But again, that's shit is weird. Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, that happened. And I was like, okay, cool. So we just missed out. We just missed out of $500,000. All right, cool. Listen, I, maybe about a year later, I was in a club in LA and I seen the DJ from Lincoln Park. I don't know if you know who he is. He's Mr. Oh, Han. Yeah, yes. Right. So I see Mr. Han and he's walking down the steps. He's wearing like a trench coat or whatever. And I'm walking up the stairs. He sees me and looks at me and literally he does a dash, turns around and runs out. He like runs away from wherever he was running. He ran the fuck out of there. <laughs> so I'm like, yo, I'm like, yo, really? Like, it, like it, he knows, like this guy knew. So it just pissed me off that we didn't have words. You know what I mean? Because he could have been a man. He could have been like, yo, bro, it ain't no thing. Just, you know, we were influenced by the chorus. Let you know he could have done anything. Here, get on a song. You know, let's do a show. Well, it could have been anything. Instead, he runs away from me, and then I'm like, "Let me find this guy," because I wasn't going to attack him. I have no reason to attack him. I wanted to just look him in the face. So I see him by the bathroom, coming out of the bathroom, and I was like, "Mr. Han, what's good, bro?" And again, he was like, "Mad nervous." I'm like, "Bro, it's all love, bro. I'm just saying what's up to you, bro." Like, you could have looked out, yeah, you know. He's like, oh, he's, like, making it, like, cop and please, like, these guys, dude, you know how that is. He's like, oh, he's like, yo, man, my bad. He's like, yo, you got busy. Yeah, whatever. So, again, it's like losing out, losing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars because these guys, listen, I'm, I don't care. I'm over it. It's, it's funny to me because people, people have hit me up and I'm like, yo, those guys fans of yours? I get a nonfiction vibe on some of that album. And I'm like, yeah, you know what I mean? So that's, that's years ago. It's yeah. years ago. It's just funny to me. 
That's crazy that you say that because I've never put that together now, too. And the more I think about it now, too, what I'm you remember from that first album, you guys know, were inspired by nonfiction. That whole yeah. first album, <laughs> nonfiction. I'm sorry, guys. I mean, they couldn't have done that because look how look how much uh, look how much they were jocking hip hop. Mm-hmm. Where the other guy had to do a song with Jay Z, and they tried to do a song with Outkast. Like I'm saying, it's obvious those guys liked hip hop. So oh, yeah. the fact that after the fact they didn't reach out to us, I thought that was whack because you guys are obviously guilty about something. Yeah, you know? I remember so when just, he started doing uh, Schnoda started doing that Fort Minor thing now too, even with Styles of Beyond. I remember Styles yeah. of Beyond all over that. You know, he could have got no friction on at least like Gore-Tex. Like, come on, you guys. Anybody, Bill, or me. I'm, I'm saying they could have got anybody, but that's the industry, bro. That's the fakeness. Of the industry, and see, you know. It's... Oh no! Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. See, and this is why I like when artists do interviews now too, because like us as fans, like we get to hear about the music now too. But when we actually get to hear about like the ins and outs of it now too, it's not all glamour. Like a lot of people should know that by now too. It's not all blend and stuff like that. You can get severely screwed over by these labels, and you can pour your heart into something and have somebody else steal it. And do nothing about it. It's completely fucked. Yeah. But, you know, the industry, the game itself is not for everybody. That's true. It's you not. It, it's like, I was thinking about this the other day. When, when, you know, when we were kids and we were starting to get serious about it, even at like 16 or whatever, there's other guys that were like rapping on the scene. They were like, we weren't, obviously, we're not the only guys. Oh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of these guys, they stopped. Yeah. Like, all these people that were neck and neck with us, we kept going. Like, regardless of, like, I had kids. You know what I mean? Like, I was working 60 hours in some deli job, you know, cutting ham and cheese, like, fucking miserable. But we were working towards something, you know? Yeah. I also we were like- working towards, like, a common goal. And, you know, when that doesn't happen and, like, you have so many letdowns, that a lot of people, it just, it breaks them. Like, I know a lot of people that, let's say they didn't get a deal or they didn't get a production deal or they didn't do a beat for so-and-so, and it just literally emotionally crushed them. Yeah. You know, so it's like the industry is not for everybody. So we put so much into it that shit was not going to stop us. I mean, we've been everywhere. You know what I mean? So it's like by 96, we, we hit, you know, we did 12 countries, 13 countries, in Europe by 96 alone, like we were getting booked all the time. Like I was just like, I had to quit my job, which I didn't want to do because of how funky and shit the industry is. So I was like, all right, I was a deli manager, which is just not a great job, but it's still a job. You know what I'm saying? It's a check every week. So I had to quit my job to basically go on tour in Europe. And that's how we made our reputation. You know what I'm saying? Just by doing hundreds of shows and doing festivals and just getting in a van, like a lot of guys, these kids don't know about that. They do, they do a grind mode cipher, and they do a video, and they get clothes. They go, they go buy clothes, oh, and that's their thing. And that's their, you know, they drop a new song every week. You know, they're best friends with these guys who run the playlist. I ain't mad at that. It's a new era. You know what I'm saying? I get it, but they don't understand how the industry really was how any kind of rep that you would have, we have without social media. If we had social media back in 96, people oh, would not shit. believe the shit. <laughs> that we could have posted. People wouldn't believe the shit we had that we could have been posted, you know? So, I you like know, it. it's, it's, it's like, I get, listen, I get a kick out of it because these kids don't really know any better. And yeah. my only thing is like, you can, you can be a fan and you can want to make records. And I think that's good. But when younger kids, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, basically teenagers, kids that are just 20, 20, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Younger dudes, they'll ask me for advice. And I'm like, I might not be the dude you want to ask for advice. Because I'm going to tell you not to do this shit. I'm going to tell you the first thing you should do is quit this shit. The first thing you should do is go to school. Find something you really, really like to do that you think you're going to have a chance. And I hate I hate to sound fucking negative, but 
most of these people do not have a chance. The game is over, bro. The the gatekeepers got that shit locked, bro. That's true. Look who's look who they're letting in the gate. They're only letting in the gate of people who are all in the same network because it's part of that thing. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I'm glad because we never sold ourselves for, sold ourselves for anything other than what we were. I didn't have to say, oh, I know I'm down with so-and-so. I'm like a new guy. Nah. West Side Gun already said it. He already said, yo, nonfiction, blah, blah, blah. All those guys, we solicit their shit, pop their shit up, boom, 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 boom. So we know that it got to the right people. You understand what I'm saying? All that shit that we did, it got to the right people. Yeah. The ones that matter. Conway, Con Conway and Westside love nonfiction. You know what I'm saying? So it's like we didn't try to we didn't go out of our way to try to kiss anybody's ass. We didn't do any of that. You know what I'm saying? Those guys, that kid, that guy didn't even have to mention us. He didn't have to mention me. We're not boys. We don't talk like I'm not trying to like you know, text him and do records with him and like yeah. there's not you know, it is like I like sitting from the back and I'm like, yo, these kids these kids are vile. These kids are dirty as fuck. You know what I'm saying? And Derringer one was one of my favorite producers as soon as that shit popped off. Because the kind of beats that he was making, we were doing those beats as kids. And you know what? People are like, yo, nobody wants to hear that. Those are weird samples. Those are weird. That's really evil. That's really nobody yeah. wanted to hear that shit. And now it's like Kids can't believe it. You know what I'm saying? They're just like they're just like taking. They're going crazy, you know. So, I personally, I, I like that shit because I like seeing it. I like seeing newer people with, you know, obviously if it's in their heart, and it's and it's it's the right way and it's the right feeling for it. You'll get further doing that. You know what I'm saying because if it's in your heart, people can see that it's really real, you know. But now, every week there's 30 new rappers. Yeah. Every week. And those 30 rappers are putting out 30 new albums every week. And it's all starting to sound very much alike. The same kind of drums, the same sounds. Listen, I don't have a problem with drumless beats because I make them myself. Oh, of course. <laughs> I just I just made new beats. Zero drums. For the Air Bell album, y'all ain't gonna check that out, y'all. Nah, no doubt. I know that's respect. But it's like, I didn't, if it fits, it fits. If it doesn't fit, you don't gotta jam them in there. Just to make a point, or just to say, oh well, I don't make beats without drums. Make a beat that sounds right for the job you're trying to do with it. Don't worry if there's drums on it or not. Is it musical? Is it fly? Is it dope? That's the only credential I look for. I don't care about drums. There's already drums on the sample. I'll take. There's already drums on it. So, you know, I like how you brought up producer now too. Because I remember when you were working at the deli. How many people can say they gave their demo to Little Kim? Hey, yo, Little Kim, I got some beats for oh, you. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. But I mean, that was one of the that's one of the perks of working in Manhattan when you worked at those delis oh, because you would see people come in, you know. So, me and Ten K, who back in the day he produced some of the nonfiction stuff like Four Ws, and some of the stuff uh, I think we all bleed. On futures now, like 10K produced that. Sure. That's the homie uh, from Department of Forensics, y'all. If you're listening, right, right, right. So that's the homie from from Glenwood back in the day. You know what I'm saying? That's the homie from like the 80s and stuff. So me and him were on the grind. You know what I'm saying? And like we, you know, we were doing stuff from years ago. And me and him, the beats we were doing were very Griselda-like beats, like very just yeah. dirty. And 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 you know, we 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 didn't care about drums either. We just cared if the loop was fresh. But I will say the dude that brought it back that constantly made beats for no drums was, was Marciano. You know what I'm saying? And and Rock Marciano, he was doing that shit back in 14, 15, and 16 when people didn't care. They weren't even making beats without drums. He kept steady doing it. So I'll give him I'll give him his props because he basically created that shit again in the 2000s and the 2010s, he was doing that. So, respect to rock, you know what I'm saying? I like that. I, I like that right there now, too, because everyone says, like, you know, he's the one who's, like, brought that back. But also now, too, now, too, I like how these guys know the history of you now, too. They may not have to do records with you. They shout you guys out, though, and they say, hey, that inspired me. I was like, you guys know it. Like, it, it blows my mind. Because right. it's like, 
you know, just do a song of them as a fan. But that's the fan in me, though. That's the fan. Right. Yeah, but we don't, you know, it's like we don't really see that that much because yeah. it's not really the climate to do that because you got so many angry guys. People are scared to give props to other people. I noticed. It's like social media. It's like these guys, they're scared to, to hit a button twice. They're scared to click something. And that's when you know. <laughs> right, but that's how you know we're living in a very dangerous time when the climate of liking stuff and, and social media input and stuff is worth more than money. Mm. So yeah. you got to look at it like if you got these people that they refuse to like your stuff, there's a reason. There's a reason they're not liking it. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of that's insecurity. And it's this theory like every, you know, these guys could have unity, but all these dudes are out for themselves because very rarely do you see a, B, and C, you see this guy post a record for his homie who put an album out. Like, yo, 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 my, my homie put an album out yesterday. Go buy this album, motherfucker. Go support that shit. You don't see that that much. It's, you know, even friends of rappers and big rappers, you don't even see their friends doing that. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed it. it's like a very, like, weird, it's like, well, what, why would you say you doubt if they're not there to support them? Like? Yeah, listen, I'll see the fans. But you don't see other rappers supporting other rappers. You don't see it. Sure. But shout out to Benny, man. He's setting a good example for all these new rappers out there. Shout out to Benny out there. What, yeah, what, no I, what, what I was curious now, too, like, I remember hearing you say that you used to do journalism before now, too. So before you got into music, you were into journal. You wanted to be a writer now, too. I was curious, like, what made you stop wanting to do journal, like, in media? Like, what, what, what happened? I don't do your girlfriend like to try to work, but like, what happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's like, yeah, I mean, you, you brought up a good point. I mean, like, I was wanting to do stuff since I was a kid, you know? And a lot of that stuff was stuff I was doing in a fanzine where it was like, you talk to a bunch of different bands, all that nerd shit, and you basically compile it yourself and you do all the work. So, you know, I'm like 13 or 14, I'm making connections in not just the hip hop industry, Metal. but also in other industries. Correct. I was also uh, I was also an intern for Sleeping Bag Records, which was EPMD's label. If you remember the first records that EPMD did, Probably too like, yeah. yeah, we were you know we were little kids. You know what I'm saying? Me and 10K, we went up to Manhattan and and you know we were that hungry. I was that hungry. I went into Virgil Virgil's office. From from uh from this company, and I was like, "Yo, we want to work, bro. Like, we're from Brooklyn. We're from you know, we 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 love. The, we're in this culture, bro. What do you got for us? We want to work." And he was just like, "Yo, he's like, y'all are teenagers. Y'all are small. He's like, I don't have much. Here's some tickets." So he gave us a stack of tickets for this place called Club Ajax in Manhattan, which had performances by like I don't know who you could say like you know Brand Nubian. Okay. Um, Chub Rock, you know, all these guys back then, you know, like Diamond D, all these guys would play these shows. So we were just promoters, you know what I'm saying? We would just go and talk to people. And honestly, me, you know, me and 10K is like, yo, we was the only dudes that, was, that wasn't black in the club. This was before hipsters and like all these like rich white kids, these <laughs> spoiled kids. This was before all that. So we, we were doing that when, yeah, we was in clubs, bro. People looked at us like, we had nine, like we had nine heads. You know what I mean? So, cool. so what's like? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't remember exactly your original question, but I was. Oh, like what made you like stop doing journalism now? Too? Oh, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. So it's like once I tried to do the fanzine, and I tried to do that stuff on my own. We were very young, so I didn't have money to, to actually print the magazine myself. You know, so I did get a little discouraged. I was still into writing. I did reviews for certain magazines, but the more I got into hip hop, like I had to like do stuff. So I didn't have enough time to do reviews and do certain interviews. I didn't have time for it. I liked it. I was still getting free tapes from like Road Racer Records and like, like, you know, I would call these people up as a 13 year old kid and people fucked with me because I sounded like a kid, but I was like hungry to be in the industry. I'm like asking for interviews and how do I get this guy's number from Testament and Slayer? 
and Nuclear Assault. All these all these bands a lot of people don't care about. But as a little kid, these were people in the industry. So these were big bands to people like me and Bill. So like these were guys that we looked up to. So by the time I was 13, I was like, I'm doing music. Like I'm going to be in this industry. I don't know how or what, but I'm going to be doing this shit. So after doing the zine and me losing all of the all of the all of the papers, all the pictures, I really didn't want to start from from zero because like the shit I was working on, if it would have came out the right way, it would have been a legendary publication now. Just because of the bands that I had in there and the legwork I did. So I'm a 13-year-old kid calling up a record label asking to talk to obituary at Sepultura who were big bands at the time, you know what I'm saying? So I would cut out of school, go go back to the crib, set up a tape recorder into my mom's phone, and I would just do interviews, just like what you're doing, you know what I'm saying? But it was, it was on the phone. I would transcribe them, type them out, and, and I would be doing that, you know what I'm saying? So about the time I was doing that, Bill had a band. Bill was doing his stuff. So we were both young kids trying to get into the industry, you know what I'm saying? So kids now, that's not even that's not even an option. The shit we'd have to do was crazy. Like as a little kid, you yeah, have in, to go to the actual place here. Right. That's what I'm saying. So like we'd be in Manhattan walking and you'd have a dude that would come up to you and like some middle aged guy, which was pretty common back then, and he would ask you, like, hey, you guys rap? Are you guys into hip hop? It was like a commercial, like a weird commercial. And we would be like, yeah, what's up? And he'd be like, oh, he's like, uh, he's like, we're going to the studio. And back in the back in the listen, in the late 80s, the studio was a big deal. No one had studios. Yeah. No one had their own Pro Tools, MPCs. Nobody had that shit. Okay. Nobody had that shit. So we were little kids. We were like, what do you mean? Like we didn't understand. And this guy's telling us, hey, we got a tour bus right up parked over there. And we're going to the studio now in New Jersey. Get on the bus, and it was really weird because it's like, yo, we don't even know this fucking guy, and this guy was trying to get me and Bill to go on the bus. We don't even know who's on the bus, just to get us to go to Jersey because he had a studio. So you see what I'm saying? Weird shit would happen back in the day that don't happen now, because everything is like everybody and their mother has a studio in their house. Their friend masters. They can. Nobody needs a, technically nobody needs a studio anymore. But yeah. But I'm saying back in the day, you yeah. could not get your hands on equipment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, I heard it was very bad. Yeah. Yeah, it was it you know, it was a different time. But back to what you were saying, um it's like I never really left the either industry. Like I'm saying, I still have I still have friends in both industries. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I still go to shows, I still maintain relationships, but you know, with the internet, print writing kind of took a backseat. Magazines weren't doing the best. So I was like, you got to put your time into something else. I mean, over the years, I got back into it. I have friends I've written for other magazines. I've done interviews with people, um, some blogs, stuff like that. Maybe one day I'll do a print magazine. You know, I'd, I'd still like to do, I'd still like to do my own magazine, you know. Um, it was just different, bro. You had to do a lot of legwork. There's yeah. no internet. So if you don't have internet, all you got is a telephone on your desk and you got your mom screaming about a phone bill, you know, so. It's different. So, yeah. Shit like was, she was like, very different, bro. It's a very inspiring story because, like, I, I, I'll make this quick. I wanted to be a rapper before I did media. I'm in my fifth year in media. I had to okay. be like Black Moon, Smith & Western, Pheromont, Speech of uh, Rest of Development. Anyone from the 90s you could pretty much think of now, too. But I wouldn't be able to do all this if it wasn't for, like, the internet. When I first started out, I didn't have a computer. I would call the artist, record right there, and print out on the internet now, too. But I, right. like, it's totally different from when you were doing it and when I started doing it now, too, because I literally yep. turned the PM. That's all you got. That's how we do it. Yeah. I mean, it just goes to show you how, how, how technology changes. Now people don't even have to work to really progress their career. I mean, they can make records, but they don't have to do as much. They don't have to do legwork. It's just, it's a different, it's a different kind of thing now.
You know what I'm saying? Would you and, um, start like your own network, like you doing like a podcast and stuff like that? Because what I noticed about you, a lot of people watch your interviews and a lot of people do care what you have to say. And with the internet, what you're saying, working from home, you know, I can see a Lord Goat interview. I mean, Lord Goat podcast taken off because, like, right. you can actually have conversations with an artist that me and you can't have because you guys are right. Like, right. Artists. I'm not an artist. Right. I mean, no, that makes sense. I mean, it's not it's not something I haven't thought about. You know, doing so, like taking a bigger step. It's a possibility. I'm not. I'm not against it. Um, it's just a matter if it makes sense. You know. A lot of stuff, you know how it is. It's time consuming, and if I do something, I don't want to do it half assed You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you want to go all the way. So like, it's a, it's a possible. It, yeah. So sorry to cut you off now, too. Like what I know, I won't take up much of your time now, too. But what I notice now, too, is now you've been on a lot of tours now, too. But you still find the time to put a lot of time into your music now, too. And what I like about this new age of the internet now, too. You have somebody like a Stu Banus hit you up, be like, "Your Gore Tech, yo, I really respect what you did before. Let's make some magic." So, what's the feeling of like a new producer? Uh, well, first off, how did that project come together? Final expertise, because man, like, I like to say that you're Magnum Opus. I do like Art of Dying, but Final Expertise just hits different because I've grown a few throughout the years and I know the story, but. I also love this underground renaissance now too. And I like how Right, right. So how does it come together? Yeah, I mean I mean I mean Stu Bangers and Final Expenses, that came about because I mean I know Stu for a while. Me and Stu were gonna make a record years ago. And um <clears throat> he just got super busy. So we were like, when the smoke clears, we're gonna do something really crazy. Let's just get these projects out, you know, finish what we gotta finish, and we can just start building. That's basically what happened. I mean, he sent me a lot of beats. I'm really picky. Like most people would know, I can't just, I dislike most beats that I hear, you know, and, and even if they're okay, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really linger for a long time. They're not, you'll know when you hear something that's like, okay, you know, cause I make beats too. Not every beat you're going to make is a banger. You might make a beat that's like, yeah, it's all right. But tomorrow I'm not going to really care about it. It's not really going to, so you want to avoid those kind of beats where you hear it instantly and you like it, but it doesn't, it's not going to last the long run, you know? Yeah. Um, me and Stu were just like, yo, let's just do something crazy. It took a while because, like, shit happens. You know what I'm saying? It's shit sometimes <laughs> takes a while. It's out of my hands or something happens or somebody loses the tape or sometimes the engineer disappears, you know, and, like he's got the tapes with him. Like all kinds of, you know, all kinds of shit that happens behind the scenes that people don't really know. So that record took a while. I mean, I like it. Um, some things could have been better, but I mean, it's cool. I mean, we definitely want to do another one. And I think the things that I wanted to fix on the first one, the, this one's going to be better, you know? Just well, the way it sounds, you know? Well, the reason why I brought that up now, too, because I noticed how a lot of artists are doing, like, the one-off producing it then now, too, is now, too. Like one producer, one rapper. But I was curious, right. too, knowing that your guys' history, because he has a record of Ail Bill, I think you guys, I want to get into that now, too. DJ Muggs, this guy is like just literally like in the underground, like crazy. You don't have to be now, too, but he's putting out some quality work, Rome Street, you know, Al Davino. So, what right. I was curious now, too, was there when the Ill Bill and DJ Muggs was happening back in two, 2007? Was there talks of a Gore-Tex and BJ Muggs album, but it never happened? Yeah, what happened was me and him were talking before that. Me and him were talking in 2005. Before he was working with Bill, he wanted to do a record with me. And, and, yeah, and it's it's a longer story, but basically there was some there was some third party. Um there was a third party involved that really had to put his nose in the middle out of jealousy and fucked up the whole deal on purpose. But in print, I mean, listen, I was in Muggs' studio back in the day. I picked out my beats. He was mad cool. We got along. The energy was dope. I got to the studio. You know what I'm saying? 
he put his laptop in my hand. He's like, yo, pick out beats. And this is a guy who I grew up listening to. And, you know, as a producer, he was definitely an influence. Oh, yeah. So so I was just with my home. I brought my homie from Brooklyn to, to the, you know, and we were just like, wow, man, this is crazy. Like, we're in the studio. And, you know, he, yo, it was mad cool. Like, he got his chef, this Japanese chick. She cooked us food. Like, you know, I, I, I'm just like, yo, he turns around. This is like big statue, like a three foot statue. And the statue is just filled with weed. It's like a weed statue. He's like, he's like, oh, he's like, yo, he's like, yo, help yourself, bro. We go, yo, we were like, all right, cool. So we just, you know what I'm saying? We just smoked like 10 blunts. We got food. Yo, the shit was cool. And um, a third party had to intervene and start posting all this stuff that we spoke about earlier, all these fake lies, Photoshop pictures, pictures of like family members of mine. Like, really, bro? Like who's like who's really is it that serious? So they posted all these pictures on soulassassins.com. And oh. and yeah, like it, it, it even shit, like you know what I'm saying? Like people know, listen, people know I, I've been smoking my whole life. You know what I'm saying? I've been smoking for years, smoking weed. But everybody that knows me, bro, no, I don't do I don't do hard drugs. I don't give a fuck what people think, what they spoke about. It's a whole different thing. You can smoke weed. But if you're talking about real shit to fuck up someone's reputation, that shit ain't cool, bro. Yeah. That shit is not respected. So somebody was doing that. And, you know, I called Muggs. Basically, I was like, listen, all this shit is on your website. All these fake lies and rumors. Like, I got kids, bro. I don't need my, my children seeing this stuff. And he was getting stressed out. You know what I'm saying? Because he's like, yo, I don't really want to get in the middle of all that. Of like, you're, I'm like, I get it. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And it was just, bro, it was one thing after another. And long story short, the record didn't come out. We didn't record, you know? So was, I'm like, all right, cool. This guy's going to fuck up another thing. And it's going to make me look like I like I did something else. Yeah. And more people are going to talk shit because they don't know well, how it really is and the way things really are in reality. So I lost that opportunity. And then because I lost that opportunity... People are going to say, oh, yeah, he didn't do this. He's lazy and blah, blah, blah. Nah, I was in the studio. I was ready to sleep there for seven days and not go back to New York. I would have slept on the motherfucker's floor. All so right. It ain't about, like, yeah, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. It ain't like I wouldn't have been dedicated. Like, you know. So, again, another missed opportunity. You know what I'm saying? Um, That's still, you know, he's still, he's still the man. But I'm pretty sure that came and went. You know what I'm saying? That that was that was a moment in time. And um, you know, it is what it is. Like I that's that's the that's the past for me. I don't really care. And obviously he likes to work with guys nobody knows. I know he likes to work with new guys. You know what I'm saying? I don't have reputations yet and he likes to work and that's cool. But I think honestly, I think we I think we could have did a classic. Cause the beats that he had that I was picking for my record. Well, well, crazy, bro. The shit, the shit's, the shit's always kind of cool. Yep. I was always, because that's why when I remember when I seen that album of Ill Bill, I remember I was like, I wonder if that's because he couldn't do the album with Gore-Tex. I remember he seen something. I, I don't know why. I think it was on MySpace or something like that. But it was like, right. Next album, Mug's not happening anymore. And I was like, oh, what the fuck? Then I seen that Bill album. I'm like, I wonder if that was the connection. So as you know, I grow old, I get to find out what actually happened. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, I guess him working with Bill was an afterthought. Like, they did that after the fact, you know? Yeah. Like, I was going to do a record of Muggs when nonfiction was still together. Before we had that temporary split back then, I was going to do the record all the way back then. Yeah, see, so, now, would you be open? Yeah, man, you know. See, one of the things I'm waiting for is just to him to be like, Lord Goat? Wait, my man Gore-Tex. Yo, Gore. Would you be ever open to that? Wait, say that again. I didn't hear you. My bad. Like, like, let's say, like, you know, Muggs open on social media one day. He's like, "Load go." I was like, "That's my man Gore-Tex." So if he just, you know, hits you up out of the your Gore-Tex, let's finish some, you know, unfinished business. Yeah, yeah of course. Why wouldn't I? And because I'm, yo, saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I would be great. I have no problems, with homie. Homies, homies, the OG. It's just I felt like. He didn't give me a fair shake, you know what I mean, to explain what was going on. And then in the process of that, 
I got locked up for like two, three weeks. It's a whole other long story. It doesn't matter, but in those three weeks when I came out, shit was already fucked up. Yeah. Now you know who. So you know who already went in there and fucked my whole shit up. Yeah. You can make lies. I'm a junkie. You can make lies. I'm an alcoholic. I mean, it got so bad that I had an Australian tour set up for, I think, February 06 or something. This is a long time ago. But I was getting good money for the shows. They were going to fly me out to Australia. I was going to do five shows around the whole country. And each show was like five grand at the time. Oh, so, um, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going out there for 25 stacks. I'm speaking to a promoter. I already know because I'm already getting hit up that everybody in Australia is happy I'm coming because I had mad fans out there, you know? So they're already talking about it. And there's a buzz. And I'm waiting to hear back from this guy because he's going to send me a check. So I'm like, all right, in order for me to do this right, we gotta we got to set it up. You know what I'm saying? So the guy hits me up. He's like, hey, Gore-Tex. He's like, uh, I got some bad news, bro. So I'm like, of course you do. Let me have it. What up? Why wouldn't it be bad news? You know what I'm saying? Like, of course, there's a catch, right? So he says to me, he's like, hey, Gore-Tex, man. He's like, my boss, you know, I really apologize. I know we got this tour was setting up, but my boss is getting cold feet. He's nervous. He doesn't want to do it now. I'm like, oh, he doesn't want to do it? You're supposed to send me 10 grand this morning. I'm not talking to you about doing the show. I'm waiting for a deposit, bro. The fuck yeah. are you talking about? And then he turns around. He's like, yeah, well, you know, he's like, I don't know who's doing it, but these guys are making it very difficult for you to come here because these guys are keep messaging my boss saying you're an alcoholic. I'm like, an alcoholic? I'm like, bro, I don't even drink beer. The fuck are you talking about? I don't even like alcohol. He's like, I don't know. You know, he's like, I wasn't going to say it, but basically Necro is saying that you can't even go to Australia and do a show because you can't stand up because you're a fall down Drop dead alcoholic. Yeah, that's a weird old shit. I'm like alcoholic. I'm like, who the fuck told you that? So, because someone turned around and they said, if you book Gore-Tex, I'll never come back to Australia. You'll never book me again if you book him. So you see how all those people, all those people jumped ship to him and didn't stay loyal to me. So, I'm like, you know what? Cool. So Australia got poisoned. Even though I still got tons of fans in Australia, it's like it's active. It's been active for years because I still have fans all over the world that still tell me. They'll still tell me, yo, so-and-so said this. It's like, you know, how old are we now? Like, come on. Yeah. It's like people are still in first grade. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> Until you, until you hit them in between the eyes with a pipe and you take their nose out, they still think it's funny to sit like this on the computer. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and listen, these could be fans. These could be anybody because <laughs> let me tell you something. Social media, it's a double-edged sword. These fans also want to stab you in the throat. So you'll have fans that also hate you. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Yeah. And you know what? It's like I never ever did that when I was a kid. See, when I was a kid, I never thought about trying to contact Guru or Rakim on the computer to send him a message. I'm That's sure unheard that. of, bro. No, who would do that? Who would actually play themselves back in the day? Not that there was internet, but yeah. who would have done? That? You know. So now it's a free for all. The messages. I mean, the shit that we get. It you know it you it, it makes you stop and think how sick disconnected and how much mental illness there is in the world right now. Yeah. Okay? Because I'll tell I'll keep it I'll keep it super funky with you before before we finish this up. You know what I'm saying? I got people right now that are just stalking me for years. Same people, bro. Same people. Mentally crippled people. All they'll do, they'll sit for years. They'll get on YouTube. Oh, Gore-Tex is a liar. Gore-Tex is a junkie. <clears throat> Gore-Tex is a pedophile. Anything you can imagine, these people still do, bro. And these people, bro, are in their 40s. They're in their 40s and they're fucking old. And these people have nothing better to do. Message my girl. 
send pictures to people. It's never ending, bro. So it's like my whole career has been plagued with people trying to actively stop what the fuck I do. But you don't stop, though. That's what I like, though. What keeps that drive going? I mean, you know, it's like no, no one's going to stop me because I was there from the beginning, bro. Like, I seen the real shit. My cousin was a DJ in Long Beach. You know what I'm saying he's obviously older, but he would he would DJ for everybody. This is a guy who basically taught me what was fresh and what was not fresh. So when I'm like seven or eight years old, he's teaching me how to do my laces. He's teaching me which pumas to buy, which pumas not to buy. See? So I had that I had that teaching at an early age. And I also knew music because he allowed me to go through his collection. Wow. So I knew I wasn't going to be in school. This shit is my school. Music is my college. You know what I'm saying? Hip-hop is my education. Music is my education. Yeah, I could have went to college and been anything. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't have to fucking worry about a lot of shit. You know what I'm saying? If I didn't do this. So technically, I made my life much harder by going this route. Right. Because there's no... Because there's no, now, it's 2023. There's no pot of gold waiting for people. They're going to get a big record deal. There's no pot of gold for any of these guys. Yeah. Unless you're 22 years old and you're a drill rapper or... You know, your cousin is Lil Wayne. You know, if you're not that, you're going to be one of these underground guys that puts out 60 records in a year. Don't make no money. Don't do any tours. But he's got 65 records out yeah. that nobody knows about. And his Spotify numbers are 7,000 listeners a month. And nobody knows who he is, but 16 other underground rappers. So it's like, it's a, it's a weird scale. You know what I'm saying? It's like you do it one way, and you could do it the other way, and you're not getting anywhere either way. So, you know, it's like a lot of people, I ain't, I ain't negative, but, yo, this shit ain't for you, bro. You know what I'm saying? This shit is not for you. If you got an option, go to school. You know, and I'll be honest with you, there's people that want to do songs with me. They hit me up. They want to do verses. They want beats. That's cool. But it's like I'll see some people struggling, and it's like I know what it is to struggle, bro. I'm a real dude. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, the yeah. shit is this game is like this game is like the stock market. You know what I'm saying? This game is up and down. Sometimes you'll be up and sometimes you'll be down. Sometimes you'll have money and sometimes you struggle. You know what I'm saying? But when I see these new guys, and some of these new guys got like five, six, seven kids, and they're out there trying to like buy beats for 15 bucks, and they're trying to buy beats for 10 bucks, and then they want to give you 50 bucks for a verse, and they're begging you for a verse. They're like, yo, 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 my man, my man, I've been listening to you. Yo, bro, bro, just do me like it's like, yo, man, you got five kids, bro. Why are you why are you trying to like beg for collabs and trying to buy fifteen dollar beats that are terrible when yeah. like your kids are depending on you? So I'll be honest with you, bro, that shit that shit bothers me. So if a kid wants to work with me and I see him like I if I see like he's you know what I'm saying, sometimes it's like social media, they'll share links. You know what I'm saying? I don't feel comfortable taking people's money. You know what I'm saying? I don't need the money that bad. Well, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna rob somebody, some kid for money, for a beat or a verse when he's struggling himself, and he can't even afford his own. He can't even take care of his own kids, and he's looking to buy beats, and he's looking to just. It's just, and he's in a really low level of. It just makes me because I have a conscience. You know what I'm saying? I feel bad for those kids. So some of these guys, it's like, yo, bro, that's just not for you, bro. Go get a job. Do I did it? You know what I'm saying? Listen, when we're recording, the future is now. While we were recording The Future Is Now, I was working 14 hours a day at a bagel store, getting up at 5 in the morning, getting up at 3 in the morning, taking a two-hour bus ride. I'm talking about miserable, suicidal, depressing, horrible jobs just to be able to survive. And then after work, I'm going to the studio with Pete Rock. You know, and it's like, yeah, of course, we paid him. We, you know, we paid him to work. But we're also on the grind. You know what I'm saying? So I just put in 14 hours in the bagel store and I'm falling asleep at the session. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm working all day. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's it's a grind, bro. A lot of people don't see that. You know what I'm saying? It's, and that's fine. I'm not, I have nothing to prove. You know what I'm saying? I'll talk to people. I'm not saying I'm better or cooler or anything, but people don't really know what it's like. You know what I'm saying? They don't know how it was to really work and how to really do legwork. And, and back then, if you did the legwork, and your shit was correct, you would be rewarded because you would get to work with all these greats. As what you guys did. 
I'm saying I would cut cold cuts during the day, but I'm in the studio with large professor all night. And I'm, we're talking about records and samples, and I'm asking Pete Rock about, yo, what about this record? And what about this guy? You know, and I'm like, bo not bothering him, but, you know. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was funny, but, like, I'm on his back. I'm asking him about all these dudes. So, for me, these are, like, dreams come true, bro. Yeah. That stuff I wouldn't trade in the world, regardless of the struggle. That stuff you don't trade, bro. That stuff, that shit you take to the grave. You know what I mean? That was your dream. And when you live it, it's like, yo, like, oh, what's happening? But yeah, bro, none of, this, none, none of the other shit really matters. You know what I'm saying? Because, yeah, I would. I wish we would have made more records, but at the end of the day, the records that are there, they're going to be there forever. And it's proof. People still like it. People still come up to me. People still listen to it. You know? So I'm not, you know, I'm not complaining. I wish we, I wish more people heard it. Because I feel not enough people heard it. I mean, I know with the with the internet and stuff, it's it's a platinum album. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, but it's gotta be two it's times a platinum. Now. It's a platinum album. I know the people that downloaded it. I know at one point, you know, it was selling a lot of copies, but it's like the guy who originally put it out is a shady piece of shit, you know? Mm -hmm. A total dirtbag. So we know we got fucked originally, but like I said, it influenced a lot of people, bro. So <laughs> it's important to me, at least, that it meant so much to other people. But I don't sit around saying, oh, the future is now. The future is now. It's so great. I don't really think about it, quite honestly, unless I'm talking to somebody or somebody asks me about it. It's not something I say, oh, well, I think I'm, I think I'm so cool and important because of this record. No, judge me about the last verse I spit on somebody's record or my solo record. I don't care what I did 20 years ago. If it's cool and it came out dope, cool. But I'm not sitting around resting on my laurels. I'm not saying, hey, everybody should, you know, come worship Gore-Tex because he made the future is now. Like, I don't care about that shit. None of that shit even matters to me. You know what I'm saying? We made a good record. It helped people. That's cool. But I look to the future. You know what I'm saying? I don't look at the past. I look at the present and the future of what I'm capable of doing, not what we did. <laughs> Because some of these new guys, like, oh, yeah, those guys are old. Those guys have been around. Like, these new guys that every one of them sounds like Rock Marciano. I'm not a hater. I think he's great. But everybody sounds like him now. So that became one style where it, I know this. If you ain't doing that style, these kids will not fuck with you. So I'm like, wait a minute. Isn't it supposed to be where everybody should have their own sound? I mean, even if people are influenced, I get it. Listen, yeah. everybody's influenced. People are influenced by Mob Deep. People influenced by Wu Tang, people are gonna be influenced by Marciano and Griselda. That's what it is. I get that. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of these guys should try harder. And when I say try harder, just try to sound different. Not like all these other guys. Flow like somebody else. Come up with a new flow. Yeah. Because honestly, bro, that's that's all I try to do, bro. Like if I wanted to, I could sound like Rock Marciano too. I prefer you. If don't. I wanted to, I if I wanted to, if I, I'm saying, if I want to be like these guys, yeah. But my whole shit is about taking chances. So to me, in a sense, this whole hip hop shit that I did, it's like you could look at it almost like it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to do something that hasn't been done before. I wanted to flow like nobody flow flowed before, for better or worse. You might not like it. You might not say, "Oh, he's not as good as uh, Razkas or somebody." But I made sure whatever I did sounds completely different than what anybody's ever done. So if it fails, I'll take it. I'm good with that. As long as it's something that's never been done before, I don't care what happens. Yeah, we all want to sell 5 million records. Yeah, of But the fact that it didn't happen, it doesn't change anything for me. It doesn't change the pleasure I get when I create because that's part of, that's part of being part of the culture. I don't need these guys to tell me, because you're not wearing uh, three grand worth of polo in every new video, like, you have to keep shopping. So if you're not shopping with these guys, they look at you like, eh, this shit is whack. This shit. It's like, they're not they're not getting that. It's like, yo, bro, you, what you're doing is you're crippling, you're crippling the real longevity by keeping that mentality. So it doesn't, you know, at the end of the day, bro, none of that shit matters. You know, and even, and, and, and 
at the end of the day, people are going to talk about what they're going to talk about. People want to forget about classic records. Some people want to pretend nonfiction never happened. I get it. You know what I'm saying? I get the way people are. They want to pretend we never had records. I noticed when some of these guys make playlists, they make 90s playlists, they never put nonfiction on them. You know what I'm saying? But back in the day, we were on every playlist, the source, all that shit. Pro tapes. Yeah, but but you know, now it's like people want to forget that we're there because motherfuckers either insecure, they never made a record, they never toured the world, they never no, they never left. Listen, you, if you never left your own backyard and you see all these other guys on planes flying around, you're gonna be annoyed. No, That's just the way it is. Listen, I used to want to tour. I'm like, yo, we got to get out there. I don't know what we got to do. So we worked hard enough to be able to go and do that. And by us going to do that, we put our kind of hip hop, which is basically, it was new at the time. Don't forget, New York Underground Street. We weren't Wu-Tang or Mob Deep, yeah. but we were right behind, I'm saying we were right behind them doing that, like putting those bricks up to that house. Carrying the flag. Exactly. So... We were carrying the flag for that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, again, like I said, people want to pretend that we never existed. But you can't tell that to the fans all around the world or the people that care, the people, you know, who, you know, it's, it's like we were there. Like, I know people that got killed where they buried they buried their friends. It, it, they covered him in T-shirts and nonfiction records in the casket. The whole casket was nonfiction. You know what I'm saying? And Necro, too, because that kid, he was a Necro fan, too. But the point is, he had all his shit in his casket. You know, it's like, that was that's crazy to me. That's very touching to me. Because he could have had anything. Like how you feel when you make music, they felt that same thing. Uh-huh. It's three, my point is, bro, it's all 360. That's very true. Things, it takes X amount of years for it to come back around. People start listening to it again. Um, we just try to do something timeless. You know what I'm saying? Something that still holds up that you can listen to now. The topics, William Cooper, you know, the Chambers, the FEMA camps, all that shit. You know, we we discussed all that. You know what I'm saying? And you look what happened. You could see what happened. And now it's now it's it's like shit is a mirage, bro. Shit is like the Truman Show. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing is real. Nothing yeah. is real. My trip says AI. It's, it's scary. Yeah, yeah, and the AI is worse than the nuclear war. So, we're not in that realm in that regard. We're not looking too good, bro. <laughs> we're not looking too good. But you know, we just gotta hope, bro. You know what I'm saying? Because I know, I know, in the next ten years, we're gonna we're gonna be pretty much terminated. There's no way that's not going to happen just because if you look closely at what they're doing, you know, it's we're not even talking about politics. Technically, we're just talking about China and Russia and, and India having nuclear war, having nukes, and they have nuclear missiles. And all these guys are talking about, you know what? We're not going to deal with the American dollar anymore. And once, once, a, once a country says that, they're not saying fuck Americans. But if they're telling you, we ain't even looking at your money. We don't want to see your American dollars here. Your American dollars are worthless now to our countries. You can bet that it's going to be those three against us. And we're going to be fighting for our fucking lives against those three countries. And all of them have nukes and they all fucking hate us. Yeah. So we're not, so we're not, we're not going to be doing too good here considering who we're letting in the country and who we're being friends with and all this other shit. So that's a whole other different topic, but we're not looking good in that regard. And, and you know, that's why if you look in the sky at any given moment, there's 15 planes shooting powder out on top of each other. Oh, that's, uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> Like I said, that's a whole other subject right now. We go on for like four hours. Yeah, I mean, listen, we, listen, we could we could get into that another time because it, you know, as a as a subject, that's you know that that's never ending. You know, what I'm saying we already know what they're capable of. You know, so yeah, it's 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 out of control, bro. You know, what I'm saying, um, 
I can't really say what's what's really in store for us, but it's not good, man. You know, well, because the stuff that the stuff they're shooting out in planes is either it's one of two things. It's either to help you, it's either to help the planet and what's surrounding it, or it's there actively to kill you instantly. And let me tell you something. I've been all over the United States in the last year. It's in every state. So what do they do? What do they have 10 planes in the sky every day for by seven o'clock in the morning? What's the real reason? So, you know, we could talk about that forever. We could do that next time, but yeah, of course. It's it ain't good, bro. It's not it's not a good thing, you know. So last thing we could do is just pray for the best. Well, yeah, bro. Well, my guy Gore, this was uh we had a lot of interviews, man. This one was one of my favorites, man. Not because you know I was a fan for you for a long time. This was an unexpected interview. We don't even ask half the questions on here. But that's what I like about having a conversation of somebody like that. So Gore-Tex, man, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time. Anytime, bro. Anytime. Anything? Anytime, bro. You know, it's like I don't I don't like to do a, a lot of podcasts and a lot of stuff. You know, people ask me and if it, it, sometimes it's just hit or miss. You know what I'm saying? Um Yeah, bro. I mean it's anytime, bro. Next time hit me up and and, and we'll continue this. I like that. We'll definitely continue this. And I appreciate um yeah, I appreciate it. For people that don't know, I got a record coming out. Um, yes. what month are we in? April, May? Oh, we're in May. Okay, so we're in May. Whatever. So pretty much, uh, I want to say June. I want to say June twenty eighth. Me and Ali got a record coming out. More uh, recognized Ali. Okay. Uh, it's called it's called Mortuary Drape, and I talked about it a little bit. We we uh we dropped the single a few months ago, and I had to go on tour, so I couldn't drop the second single, or else I would have put it out. Uh, with me, me recognized and uh, Pro Dillinger. It's oh, called Coke. It's called Coke. It's called Coke Synagogue. Yeah, the shit is crazy, bro. The shit is crazy. So the shit I got dropping, bro. The next, it's it's some other shit, bro. It's like if people never heard that old stuff, it's just something new. It's just a completely new for me at least. It's a new vibe. You know what I'm saying? So people should go check that out. Run that up. Um, me and Bill also were doing an album. Okay. Where it's just me and Bill. Yeah, it's me and Bill. It's a group. And you're Fair pretty name. much the first you're pretty much the first person I told. People don't even know about this shit. Oh shit, yeah. World exclusive, y'all. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. So it's it's I'm gonna make an announcement at some point. You know, but I don't want to really announce it until Oh March yeah, of course. Line up. Yeah. But yeah, bro, it's, there's there's stuff coming out. You know what I'm saying? So everybody, everybody that's supporting. That's keeping it a hundred. That 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 fucks with my shit. Yo, I, I appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? Because real people are few and far in between. You know, it's just it's just you know. So, but yeah, bro, I appreciate that. That's love. Um, yo, thanks for having me. Hey, my guy. Yeah, I don't even have to ask you if there's anything you want to promote. Yep. That's my question, my guy. So, yo, if you made, yeah, bro. I got a complete legend, and I don't care if he doesn't think he's a legend. The legend in my eyes, legend in that. Of America, Legend of Canada, one and only Lord Go. I thank you, my guy. Yo, respect, bro. Peace to you and your family, bro. Yeah.